And nice to see some folks from Victoria too. Fun. Mm -hmm. Carolyn and I are both in Victoria, so it's always nice to see our island folks. And I'm in Vancouver. But I'm from Banff originally, so Calgary Ooh. in the mountains. Gosh, lucky you. I wonder if we'll get anyone from Banff. That'd be funny. <laughs> Maybe I my mom. Like <laughs> Lots of Victoria, actually. Yeah, Dave, I agree. All great places to be. Hello from Toronto, representing the six. Halifax, that's the furthest so far. That's awesome. Uh, Halifax and the last name's O'Brien. What a what a Nova Scotian name. Love it. Cool. We'll get started in a couple minutes here, but there's still people trickling in from the waiting room. I also see some Lighthouse Labs alumni in here. Sadie, you might recognize a couple names as well. Love it, alumni supporting alumni. Yay, yeah, I do recognize some names. Lighthouse seems like it has an amazing alumni support, kind of. <laughs> we love our alumni community. We just um, put out an event for a holiday Christmas sweater party, a virtual one that I'm a little bit too excited about because I'll get to wear my holiday vest and show it off. Okay. Oh, an ex instructor as well. Nice. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'm going to get started. I think there's still going to be a few more people trickling in from the waiting room, um, but I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Caroline, the partnerships lead here at Lighthouse. And I think this is actually our fourth imposter syndrome event uh, so far that we've had in 2020. It's been definitely our most loved event of the career accelerator. And I think it's because it's a really important topic. Um, so for people who are new here, it's, and it's the first Career Accelerator event. Uh, this initiative was launched uh, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic um, as a sort of community for people who have had their careers interrupted um, or have had some time to reflect on their career trajectory because of the pandemic. Um, and essentially it's a resource community with um, workshops, events, networking opportunities, um, and advice from experts from Lighthouse Labs and also industry experts uh, like D Dispatch, um, who's partnered with us on this event today. Um, and yeah, like I said, the imposter syndrome has been one of the, one of the most well attended events. So we're really excited to get started. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Sadie to introduce herself, but just before we get started, um, I just wanted to let everyone know that we are recording today's event. Um, so throw all your questions in the chat. We'll try to get to all of them. If you do turn your mics on at the end of the event, when we have time for questions, uh, just know that you might be recorded. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, but really excited to have you here, Sadie, one of our alumni, uh, and I'll hand it over to you to get started. Awesome, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is a really, a really fun event to be doing and I, I love all of the Lighthouse alumni stuff that goes on. Um, so yeah, I'm Sadie. Uh, I have been working as a developer for about two and a half years now. And just for a bit of context on like what got me there, I was living in London in the UK for, for seven years, um, which had started off as a bit of like a travel adventure and I, I ended up staying and living there and really enjoying it. And I was working in what ended up being a, an HR career. Um, I had started working for a restaurant group over there and working in their learning and development department. So I was kind of doing a range of things. I was there for five years working on organizing workshops for managers and senior chefs on kind of leadership training um, and also helping with the training academy. So when new team members come on board, um, they go through a fairly rigorous training process. And I ended up being uh, responsible for purchasing an, a learning management system. Um, and what that meant was we purchased like an external learning management system and then it was down to us to kind of implement that into the company. 
and it involved a lot of kind of techy things. So hooking it up to our HR system so that we had all of our employees flow through there. Um, and th these are obviously things that I wasn't doing myself, but I was like the go-between between between the developers and the HR team. And gradually I was finding that the work that I was really enjoying was like looking into the spreadsheets and trying to make sure the data was aligned. Um, and I found a lot of the times when I was having to go and ask developers to work on things, I really wanted to know like how that was done. Cause so I was like, if I, if I just knew how to do this then I could, I could do it myself. Um, so anyway, that kind of came around with a bit of a change when I decided to move back to Canada. Uh, a friend of mine had actually done the lighthouse labs program a year before. And she was like, you, you've got to do this. Um, and it was around about the time I was kind of thinking maybe like HR is not the, the avenue I want to go down. Um, and yeah, so I moved to Vancouver March, 2018 and I took lighthouse. And then in May I graduated the program and ended up getting my first job as a junior developer for a little game studio, uh, in Vancouver. And yeah, now I'm here. That's awesome, Sadie. I love hearing the journeys of how people end up taking boot camp because that, I think that's a common one where you're working alongside someone who codes and you just get really curious. <laughs> um, so, so that's really cool. Um, so to get started, now that we know you a little bit more, to get started on the questions Hello. imposter How's syndrome. It? How's it? Oh, can we just get everyone to mute? Um, to get started on the questions of imposter syndrome, how would you describe imposter syndrome in your own words? I think imposter syndrome for me was something that I always had, but I had never really put a name to it probably until I got into tech. And it's, it's really your, your inner critic and that little voice inside that is saying that what you're doing is not good enough. Um, and often, and I, I have to say, like, we're talking about imposter syndrome now and a lot of what I'll probably talk about is imposter syndrome at the beginning of my career in tech, but it's something that is absolutely like permeates through. And I still find myself now describing sometimes I'll say to people and I've caught myself doing it. I'll say, Oh, I took a lighthouse. And then like I scammed my way into a job. And it's that feeling of thinking like, I don't nest, I don't deserve this. Um, and I, they're, they're going to find out that I'm a fraud. Um, it's that kind of constant feeling. So that's sort of what imposter syndrome is for me. Yeah, I think it, this event becomes more interesting the more that we do because a, a, a few people have said the same thing that they didn't know what name to put uh, to this feeling until they got into the tech industry. So I think that's a really interesting thing to point out. Um, and definitely that inner critic is, is another way of, of putting it. Um, just to sort of make this interactive, if, if anyone is um, like listening to Sadie speak and is, has felt that way before or is feeling that way in their career right now, throw that in the chat. Um, that's a really great way for us to sort of be a bit more of a community around this topic. Um, so you come from a background in HR, which I think a lot of people would think is on a complete other spectrum from uh, a career in, in technology as a web developer. So how has your experience of imposter syndrome been different in your previous career when maybe you didn't know what label to put on it compared to um, your current career as a, as a back-end engineer in, in the tech industry? It's really interesting. I've been thinking about this a lot. And so I've made some notes as well. So if you see me looking off to the side, I'm just looking at kind of some notes about these things. I think my experience with imposter syndrome has been very different in, in my two careers. Um, one thing I think that contributes to that a little bit is I went from being in a very female dominated industry. Um, HR is at least in the UK and I imagine here as well, is very much female dominated and tech on the other hand is very male dominated and that doesn't i don't think that necessarily contributes to imposter syndrome and i have to say that in both my jobs in tech like i've worked with wonderful wonderful people and i've never been made to feel like i was an outsider but at the same time 
when you are the only person, when you are the, like the only one in the room, it's hard not to feel like you are kind of on the outside a little bit. Um, and I think that can really contribute because it's that sense of belonging where if you aren't seeing people like you, then it can be sometimes hard to feel like you belong. So I think from that perspective, I didn't really feel that when I worked in HR. I always felt very, um, I think it was very congruous with like the other people that I worked with. Um, it was probably very much the flip side. Like I think we had one male on our team at one point. So he probably felt that a little bit. Um, the other thing is there's like a big difference in disciplines, right? So coding, and I think one thing that contributes, I'll talk about, like more about this, but one thing I think that contributes to the imposter syndrome when it comes to coding is that like, coding is really fun. And it's something that a lot of people do, not just for work. Um, and a lot of people have side projects that they're working on on the side. And I find a lot of times, you know, you come in after the weekend and people will be talking about what they did on the weekend. And someone's like, oh, I built this cool like GraphQL something, something. Um, and I solved this really neat bug on the weekend. And it's really easy in those scenarios to think that, to feel the pressure that you have to be coding 24 seven. And to feel like if you're not engaged on that level, that you're not um, as strong a, a developer as the people around you. And on the flip side of that, uh, HR is not fun. <laughs> um, I mean, I, like, I think training and learning and development is fun, but you're not coming in from your weekend and going like, I did a disciplinary this weekend. It was really great. Um, so I think there's a bit more separation of even just like your life and your work. And so even that, when coding is really tied to maybe your identity and your, the things that you do in your spare time, it can be really hard to separate that from like how you kind of feel about yourself. Um, that being said, I definitely have had those feelings of imposter syndrome. Um, I come from a background of like, I don't have formal education in terms of a university degree. And I think that probably um, is somewhat of a chip on my shoulder of feeling even in my career in HR where I did eventually, I got a training administration certification down the line, but for a long time I was just working and, you know, trying to learn. Um, and I kind of went through the ranks. Like I started off as, uh, in an administrator capacity and worked my way up to being a manager. Um, but I think my confidence was certainly if I look back on that now, and I think this is really common when you, when you work your way up through a company, uh, even when I was a manager, um, in terms of like compensation and, and role title, I wasn't viewed at the same level as my peers, even though I was performing the same role. And I think that was a lot down to, I mean, ultimately there's, there were some organizational issues there, but it was also down to my confidence in not feeling like I was good enough to kind of ask for or even demand those things because looking back on it now, I think those are things that I would have been entirely reasonable in asking for. Um, and that's kind of different from how I feel now in tech where a lot of my imposter syndrome comes from more day to day where I go, oh, I can't solve this problem. I'm a terrible developer as opposed to, you know, I think I have a very, well, I do have a very supportive environment, especially with my, in my workplace and my managers. Um, I get a lot of feedback and I think on a grander scale of things, I don't feel like I'm, uh, I don't know, kind of clawing, clawing my way up, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think you touched on, I'm like writing notes frantically. <laughs> I think you touched on a, a lot of really great points and I can see Elena nodding her head too because she is in HR. <laughs> um, so I think one that really um, stood out to me was talking about being a female on the, in the tech industry and how that contributes to your feelings of imposter syndrome. And I think it's really important um, that you also included vice versa, where in, in HR, the, the males that were in that industry probably felt imposter syndrome a little bit more. And, and in, in these conversations that we've been having in the imposter syndrome series, often even the speakers have sort of grappled with feeling like imposter syndrome was something that 
they had in their own head or that they were responsible for. Um, but it's really contextual and um, it depends on what industry you're in, what stage of your career you're in, the education background you have, all of those things. So you touched on a lot of really great points there. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's, it is really hard not to feel like it's just something that exists inside your own head. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a lot that, that more senior people, companies and organizations can do to address that. And I think it's kind of shouldering a bit more of that responsibility when it comes to the people that work for you as well. Absolutely. And I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that in, in some of our later questions too. So um, really interesting point. Um, it, to rewind a little bit, because you were talking about um, education, what has your boot camp experience taught you about imposter syndrome? Being a part of Lighthouse Labs, I know that this is a topic that comes a up a lot from uh, the admissions process to deciding to commit to boot camp, um, and then of course throughout that 12 week process as well. Do you have any specific examples of when you really felt imposter syndrome sometime in that journey? Um, or, or tell us a little bit more about that experience. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think I think Lighthouse was probably the first time that I really had like a name to put to imposter syndrome. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from, you know, the, the first day we had, there is a big long chat about imposter syndrome because the folks at Lighthouse are very aware that that's a thing. And I think having a really supportive environment and community where I was learning to code was a huge thing. Um, I was really lucky. My cohort was really tight. We, we became really good friends quite quickly and established quite a lot of trust with, with one another. So we would work quite closely with one another. Uh, and we're still like, I'm still good friends with, with quite a few of them. Um, and also, you know, having, having quite a bit of support, but that being said, uh, I think it was probably the hardest I've worked and the most I felt like I couldn't do it, if that makes sense. And I think particularly in the first two weeks, so the first two weeks of, of Lighthouse, I found really tough. Um, I was used to a job that I was good at and I didn't have to maybe necessarily put in as much effort as I did at Lighthouse, which is you know something to admit. Um, I was used to being good at something and then all of a sudden I was really, really bad at something. And that was just kind of a struggle for my ego. Um, and I definitely had moments where like I cried in the bathroom. <laughs> I don't know if anyone knows the old Gastown lighthouse location, but that bathroom was my friend for like a good solid two weeks of the boot camp. Uh, but I was definitely, I got a lot of help. Well, yeah, I think psychological help from just the people around me because I could see that everyone was going through the same thing. So, and I imagine, like, I think it's good to acknowledge, I imagine the people going through the boot camp right now are finding that a bit more difficult because of the like remote nature. Um, I think I was very lucky that we were in the same space um, and everyone was, you know, ultimately everyone is at pretty much the same level in terms of learning. And so everyone kind of has their ups and downs. Um, and there was a lot of support there. So that was great. Um, yeah. And I think, I think the ultimate thing is that learning that you don't have to do it alone. That's definitely, you know, Lighthouse in particular as a program. And I know other boot camps are structured this way as well. They're not designed to be done by yourself like you need support and you need supportive mentors and you kind of need to learn how to ask for that help especially if you're someone that's maybe not used to asking for help often yeah absolutely i i think uh, that feeling of going from being some uh, really good at something like you're 
previous career path in, in HR and then going into something that you have no clue about is probably the way millions of people are feeling right now after being laid off or furloughed from an industry that they've been in for a really long time that not only they're losing that position but that industry is is changing and they're I mean, kind of becoming imposters in a in a completely different industry. So I think that's a good point. And I, I think the other good point that you brought up was we often just see the success stories of when people have have made a successful career transition or have graduated from boot camp, but we don't see the crying in the bathroom scenes. Um, and I think that in and of itself contributes to imposter syndrome because you think you're the only one who's crying in the bathroom throughout boot camp, <laughs> especially when we're isolated like this. And, and that's not the case. We all cry in bathrooms. <laughs> I feel like it's an important thing to mention. Absolutely. Um, there was a great question, sorry, Carolyn, from the sidebar. You mentioned a couple of times those first two weeks, like the hardest part. What changed? Like, how did you get used to the circumstances you were in after that? That's a really good question. I think, I think after the first two, re two weeks, I realized it didn't kill me. I, you know, I had gotten through it, even though it was a struggle, even though it was really tough. Um, I was able to get through it and realize that I was still there and I was still in the program and I was also enjoying it too. I think the other thing about encoding in particular for me is you spend, let's say there's no middle ground, I find. I either feel like I'm the worst developer in the world or I feel like I'm the best developer in the world and everything's amazing and I solved a problem and it's wonderful. And those moments make up for it. If, in a, in a sense, and I, I think maybe maybe for my mental health, I should find some middle ground there. But I think the the joy of solving problems and the I think the hard things that you go through to to get to that point. So all of the times that you're like, I can't get it, I can't get it, I can't get it. When you finally do, it feels great, and it's really rewarding. Um, and I think the more I started to have those moments, the better I started to feel. And then once I got into kind of the third, fourth, fifth week of the program, I was still feeling imposter syndrome and I was still, you know, then I was starting to feel the stress of finding a job. Uh, but I had passed kind of a threshold of feeling like I absolutely can't do it. And it was more like, I can do it. It's not great, but I can do it at least. Thanks yeah, for that's a good question question up, Alana. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think too, yeah, realizing that you're supposed to feel sometimes like you don't know what you're doing and you will eventually figure it out. So it's, it's really a practice, imposter syndrome almost. Um, so at Lighthouse, you mentioned a couple ways that um, as an organization, they've worked to sort of um, navigate imposter syndrome with their students. So you mentioned sort of talking about it in, in detail on, on day one, um, working with other team members, like not going through it alone, um, mentorship, et cetera, those types of things. Um, as someone who's now working in tech, how you, you mentioned that some of the responsibility lies with the businesses and organizations to sort of um, help their employees navigate those feelings. Um, have you seen any examples of that in your career? Um, or do you have any ideas around how organizations can do a better job of that? Yeah, definitely. I, so I'll preface this by saying that I have been really lucky. I've worked, I've worked in two dev jobs now, one for the small game studio and now I work for Dapper Labs, which is a larger, uh, a larger studio. Um, I've worked for and with really great mentors. And I, I just want to preface that because I know that's not always the case in tech. I know that, that that experience varies greatly. But what I can say from the good things that I've had, um, in my first job, I had a really fantastic mentor. And it was a really small team. It was just the two of us on the back end. So my tech lead, Sean, is just incredibly supportive. And really kind of went out of his way to even say to me, 
um, you know, like if you ever feel stressed or if you, you know, if you want to talk about stuff, you can, you can come talk to me. Um, and he really made a point as well. And I think this is huge. I think this is a really small thing that, that senior developers can do, but it's it, the impact it has is huge. He really made a point to um, celebrate his own mistakes. So when he was working on a coding problem or a bug that he'd created, or he spent two hours working on something and it turned out to be a typo because ultimately that happens to everyone no matter what seniority you're at he would you know like turn around and be like oh my god you'll never believe what i just spent the last two hours doing and we'd like joke around about it and really kind of normalized that and i think that is something that we have an opportunity to do in tech because bugs mistakes typos are just things that happen and we kind of have to accept it. I think in other industries, um, those things are seen or maybe, I don't know, mistakes are seen as a little less acceptable. There's definitely things I can think about in my HR past that like, I don't think me and my manager would be joking around about. Um, but even now, you know, when I've taken down, when I took down prod for the first time, everyone is just like, oh, well, you have to do it once. There's a very uh, less ego driven kind of attitude towards that. And again, that's not that's not every every tech studio, but definitely the people that I have around me at the moment and have done in the past have been very kind of open or, about those things and treating treating them as a learning experience as opposed to a mistakes that you made that you must be berated for in a sense. Um, and it, yeah, I think I think that comes down to management but culture within an organization it's kind of being able to foster that psychological safety where you know i feel i feel very comfortable going to my senior developer and telling them that i messed up a migration file and deleted some data by accident um, because i know that they will treat it as something to learn from something to figure out how to fix and not something that where blame is kind of thrown about yeah, I, I love that. And yeah, there's, I mean, there's the sayings in, in tech, like fail fast and all that kind of stuff. So it's definitely baked into the culture of, of tech. Um, and, and I think that that's one of the missions of the Career Accelerator and the Imposter Syndrome series is to sort of normalize imposter syndrome and, and have um, people of all different levels um, in all different stages of their careers talk about it and acknowledge it um, and sort of build community around it at, so that there's an opportunity for it uh, for it to propel us forward instead of hold us back. Um, yeah. So coming coming from boot camp, you you spoke a little bit to this, but um, I'd love for you to elaborate on um, and, and, and share your insight on um, how members of the tech community who haven't come up through a traditional path, um, like going and getting their uh, computer science degree, or maybe they've come from a completely different career path, uh, like you have, um, how do they sort of navigate, or how have you navigated those forces that make them feel like you don't really belong? Yeah, so, um, that's a really good question. I think, I think one thing, one thing to say about this is, and you talk, we talk about it a lot in Lighthouse as well, because there's definitely that feeling of, you know, I, I don't have a computer to science degree. Am I, am I going to get a job? Um, I think having direct experience with this, people that have boot camp backgrounds and people that have computer science degrees work really well together and teams that are made up of both are actually really great teams because there's strengths on both sides that really lend each other lend um lend their strengths to each other and i think that's something to embrace you will definitely come across some places that maybe like won't hire someone without a degree uh, and i've generally found that those are places that probably wouldn't be a good fit for me anyway, if I were to work there. Um, 
so I think that's I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, I think it is looking at where you can find your valuable contributions. And so I always say this to bootcamp students as well is I think we really as as a student, I think we tend to kind of undervalue our previous experience because a lot of people in bootcamp have previous experience. And I think it's really great to look at how that can funnel into a job as a developer or a job within the tech space. Um, and one way that I used that to my advantage was, and something that really helped me kind of overcoming imposter syndrome in my first year as a developer was I had this training background in teaching and I was really lucky and I was able to combine that with tech and I started teaching the um, intro to front end course with Lighthouse. So I did that part time on the evenings for a couple months uh, back in 2019. And it was something that I was good at. I was like, I, I kind of knew that I had this teaching background and something that I that I wasn't familiar with. And especially I was working as a back end developer at the time and it was in front end. So I was kind of out of my depth. But um, the thing with teaching and I, I think regardless of your background, I don't, you don't have to have a training background. Um, things like volunteering. Well, I did some volunteering with Canada Learning Code just as a mentor. Uh, is really valuable because you forget all of the things you've learned. And it's not until you're in a room with someone that's asking you how to create an HTML file that you realize you actually do know things. Um, and I think that really, really contributes. And the other thing is teaching, you don't have to be an expert. You have to have an understanding of something to teach it. You don't have to be an expert. And it doesn't matter. And I, I was... Um, kind of giggle because I was teaching a, a course on Flexbox and I used, I had given them a resource, Flexbox Froggy, um, which I think is in the curriculum for Lighthouse now because it's great. Um, and I was talking about how it was the thing that for me finally made Flexbox click and I understood it. And I was, I was teaching this class and in my head, I was like, they don't know that that only happened two days ago. So, yeah, so I think, I think find things that you are good at and try to combine them in with tech and then you can use them as like little, these little slivers to get you further and further to feeling more and more confident. Um, and teaching's one way. I think there's a lot of, a lot of other ways I've seen people um, with project management backgrounds be able to leverage that into jobs that they're really enjoying working in tech. Um, I've seen people with like financial backgrounds end up working in places like fintech companies um, as junior devs, but it's because they've got that background knowledge too. Definitely. I love, um, I love, that's probably one of my favorite parts of working at Lighthouse is seeing where people come from and where, what they end up doing with um, their boot camp knowledge. And oftentimes it, it does complement their previous careers, even when you don't think that it's at all relevant. So you touched on some, some good points that I don't think a lot of people would have thought about. Um, okay, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what the next best question is here, but I, rewinding a little bit, um, Elena is actually nudging me about a point that you made earlier, which I think was a really good one, um, about how coding is, is a fun career path, so a lot of people do it in their spare time, and as a result of that, it becomes sort of intertwined with your identity. Can you like maybe expand a little bit more on that and how you can um, work to separate yourself from your career. I think that's probably even more relevant in, in the pandemic where your office is now also your bedroom or your kitchen or whatever. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think this is kind of applicable to probably every career now that is currently working from home. This is something I've thought a lot about because it's something I've definitely struggled with. Um, particularly when I was finished the program and when I was looking for a job and even in my first year of starting, starting a job, I felt guilty if I wasn't coding every day. And I, I felt like I was going to fall behind. And 
I think looking back on that now, and I think what I'm able to do now is say, you know, working full time, 40 hours a week is enough. I'm still learning loads and that is totally enough. I actually saw a really good tweet the other day and it was just basically saying like, I, I don't code in my spare time for fun. I love my job. And I, and I, I resonated with this tweet quite a bit because I, I do love my job and I have had, you know, things that I've enjoyed working on on the side and maybe I will pick up a little project or something like that. But right now I'm just working. And especially in the middle of a pandemic, the things that I'm trying to do are, the things that I'm trying to do outside of work are very far away from coding because I think that is what's helping me A, stay loving my job and B, just stay kind of mentally healthy. Um, I think working or coding or programming all the time works for some people. And I absolutely, you know, I have admire people that they, who get energy from that and who are comfortable and happy to work on projects all weekend long. I don't, I need time to recharge. I will burn out if I do that. And I'll come back to work on Monday and not like what I'm doing because it's the same thing that I was doing before. So, and this is definitely something that I've found trickier now because I'm working from home. Um, my computer is right there. It's very tempting to try and solve all of the problems that I currently have on my plate by the end of the night, but I'm definitely appreciating just switching off and getting outside and, and the things that I do outside of work, I think make me a better developer because they give me that time to recharge. And the other thing I don't think people talk about a lot is that coding is a creative endeavor. It's a creative thing and you have to find creative solutions to problems. And I don't, I'm not able to be creative if I am burnt out. I think that's so important and probably a lot of alumni or job seekers or wherever you're at in your career in the audience um, are probably feeling a bit of a sigh of relief being like, oh, we don't have to be coding in our free time all the time. Um, it, it's de definitely something that's really unique to um, to coding and, and development. You don't hear a lot of other careers, like you said, doing HR in their free time or marketing in their free time. Um, so I think that was a really good point. Um, and if anyone has any other questions on that, uh, please feel free to throw them in the chat. I'm gonna ask one more question um, before we open it up to the audience. And that's just, what would you tell your past self um, or someone who's just looking to break into the tech scene and feeling like an outsider? Um, what's sort of one piece of advice that you would give them if they're considering boot camp, especially if it were from a completely different career? I would say that the industry needs more people like you. I think the tech industry needs more people with diverse backgrounds. The tech industry only benefits from having more diversity and having people with different backgrounds, different experiences, different education is only a strength. So for every time that you're sitting there thinking like, I'm not good enough, remember that actually you are bringing a strength into an industry that is kind of desperately seeking it right now. Um, an industry that's been very much kind of the same for a very long time. Um, and I, I think we're seeing, especially in, you know, even in big Silicon Valley companies, how diversity is actually strengthening their product and their, uh, their profit as well. So yeah, I, th I think it's really easy to, um, to forget that um, or to not realize that, but it's definitely a strength. Um, and I'd say, you know, take some time as well to look back at, at how far you've come, because especially in tech, tech is so broad. Coding is so broad. There's so many things. There is always going to be something that you don't know. Like 
tech is impossible to master. Even if you focus on one single thing for the rest of your life, you're probably not going to master it. Um, and, and that's really tricky sometimes because that can be quite different from, from different industries. And because it's so broad, we spend so much of our time looking forward at the things that we need to learn or to understand or the things that we don't understand. And we spend very little time actually reflecting on the things that we do know. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that can help too. Yeah, I'm at a loss for words. I think that that it hits the nail on the head for sure about the way that, that the conversations that we've had about imposter syndrome up until this point, I think that's even more relevant uh, now uh, with the pandemic. Um, and I think it's an important conversation too, like diversity in terms of education and career paths as well, um, which is something that's not necessarily as talked about, but we need people with environmental science degrees in technology. We need political scientists in technology, um, all that kind of stuff. So um, I can see lots of people um, sort of echoing your comments and saying, I, I always felt like I was alone and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just sifting through the chat here to see if there's some questions. Um, and there's one that is asking, were you ever concerned with the oversaturation saturation of people pivoting into coding-based careers in landing a position? Did you feel the competi competition was high across tech companies in Vancouver? That's a great question. Um, it definitely crossed my mind when I was, when I was in boot camp. And I think also, I want to recognize that I did boot camp two and a half years ago, and I think things are quite different now. I think I think there are more people going through boot camp right now. Um, when I did boot camp, there were, I, and especially being in Vancouver as well, uh, this probably doesn't apply to every place, but there were quite a few jobs. Um, I don't know exactly how that looks like right now. I haven't been like job seeking for, for a little while. Um, but it definitely crossed my mind and I, it was a worry. I think one thing that I kept in mind about that is that jobs, tech jobs are only kind of multiplying right now. So even though we might have more, saturation in terms of of maybe boot camps or even you know computer science degrees um i think tech is a popular kind of career choice right now we do have a lot of people going down that route i'm also pretty comfortable with how jobs are multiplying that might make it trickier maybe that makes it trickier for people going through boot camp <clears throat> sorry, boot camp right now, but de definitely not impossible. Um, and I think, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's a great answer. I, I think it's something to, to think of. I don't know exactly what kind of stats are right now about that. Um, but it's definitely something I've thought about. Yeah. And, and um, who, to whoever asked that question, if, if you are considering boot camp, um, we do um, sort of monitor the industry trends and our career services is really in tune um, with what's going on there. So um, I won't go through the full report on, on this chat, but definitely send us an email and um, we're always keen to talk more about that because um, it's a really good question. Um, there is another one here. As a generalist with a diverse background, I find it quite difficult to break into an industry that mostly posts for techni technical specialist roles. Any advice for someone that is looking to make connections within the industry, especially now that networking opportunities have changed quite a bit? Yeah, that's true. It is tricky right now. It's, um, I think, looking back a couple of years ago, we had sort of a lot more networking events in person and it was a lot easier to make those connections. I would say there are still ways to make those connections and events like these are great. Um, I 
think it's also really valuable to look at your, so wherever you're living, and even, I, I mean broader now too, and that that's kind of a, an advantage where we are having a lot of remote work now available to us. Look at companies that have job descriptions that are advertising for maybe not necessarily um, computer science degree, five-year experience jobs. Look for companies that have really kind of open cultures. And even if they're not advertising for uh, junior roles, I think it's really worth talking to those companies and talking to the people that work there because oftentimes, and I'll say like the, the job I'm in right now was I, when I applied, it was for a senior position that I, I knew I wasn't a senior when I applied, but they work, they work with Go, which is the language that I, that I have coded in. And I applied just because I was looking for a job and I reached the point where I was kind of just getting ready to throw stuff at the wall. And I ended up getting it not as a senior, but because there was a fit there. So I, th I think that's, I mean, I think that's always valuable advice is for apply for things, even if you don't match the exact criteria, but also reach out to those companies, find the places that you think would have a good mentorship culture, because I think that makes a huge difference um, in terms of getting started in an industry. Industries that really promote mentorship are the ones that are going to care a lot more about their juniors and give them a lot more opportunity to learn and to grow. But it is hard and I, like, I want to also acknowledge that it is tough and looking for, for your first junior job is not easy. Um, keep applying for stuff even if, even if this isn't like your first, your first job, it, it is really hard. Um, but eventually like, you know, like I said, you throw enough stuff at the wall and something will stick, but, but yeah, try to try to kind of find places that you think you would like to work. And I love that throw enough stuff at the wall and something will stick. I, I'm going to repeat that in my head. Um, sometimes it's bad advice, but sometimes it's good. And that's, I think that's my like job searching um, attitude. When I was looking for a job outside of boot camp, I um, I spent I I would meet up with my friends from boot camp and we would spend some time, usually the mornings, uh, applying for jobs and looking for jobs, and then the afternoons working on even just some of the curriculum from Lighthouse. But it can be little projects, and I think that's where working on side projects is useful, is when you're not working because it keeps you kind of engaged and and it keeps you um you know sort of motivated it motivated me quite a bit um yeah that makes sense um so moving beyond job seeking a little bit there's a question in the chat um looking for advice on the first few days or first few weeks and probably even months on the job um how do you learn the most how do you get the most out of that time and and make a good first impression great question yeah i think First, first days, weeks, months are really important. Um, they're really important, but also I want to say that you are there for a reason. So don't forget that you were hired for a reason and, and you belong to be there. Um, I know I'm really guilty of feeling like in my first kind of three months on a job, I always feel like that's when the imposter syndrome is at its height. And I feel like I have three months and they're going to figure it out. So if I can just get past three, three months, they can't get rid of me. Um, so yeah, try not to have that outlook maybe. I really like to look at how I can improve existing systems. So when I first start on a job, there's lots of onboarding material. Um, I mean, hopefully there's some onboarding material. Maybe there isn't, and maybe that's a really good opportunity to build some onboarding material. Um, I've found... Yeah, finding ways that you can have some sort of an impact, even if it's just improving some documentation. Um, so when you come across something that you don't understand and you have to ask someone how to do that, that's a really great opportunity to go, hey, maybe we should record this for, for the next new person that starts because I guarantee they will probably have the same question. Um, ask lots of questions 
as well. You know, you are there to learn. I would treat your first couple weeks, months, days as a learning opportunity. You're really there to learn the company. You're there to learn the code base. Um, ask questions about why things work the way they work. So why there are certain code implementations, why, you know, certain things are in certain repos, et cetera. Um, I think that that just really helps your understanding. I think it's important that you mentioned there that imposter syndrome is going to be at its height when you're starting a new job. So for any of you who are job seeking right now or about to start um, a new job, remember that when you are having those feelings that you're supposed to feel like that and ask questions anyways. Um, the other question here is, um, you've spoken to the importance of mentors a couple times. Um, what are some ways that you have found good mentors in the industry? Um, and, and what do you suggest looking for in a mentor? So I have, I've come about kind of some mentors just naturally through, through the lighthouse program, um, through, and through my, my jobs. So even now I'm in you know, I'm working at a different job, but I still keep in touch with my senior from my first job where I was a junior. Um, and sometimes I'll ask him for advice. Um, I think I think that part is almost more about just building relationships, um, asking people for advice. I'll tell you one thing is that like seniors in tech love to give advice, even unsolicited advice. So I think there's definitely value in just approaching, you know, if you find someone that you think um, has an outlook that you, that you would like to share or has valuable things that they can, they can advise you on, you know, ask them, hey, what do you think? Um, look, I'm trying to learn X, Y, and Z. Where do you think I should start? Or, hey, like, I'm trying to get from junior to intermediate. Do you have any advice for how I can get there? Um, actually finding the mentors is, is kind of, it can, I guess it can be different. Um, there are those natural ways of, like, through jobs, working with your seniors. Uh, there might be scenarios that you don't have a senior developer and you don't necessarily have that mentor. I would say reaching out to community events, so places like Lighthouse, um, Places like Canada Learning Code as well. I think everyone here is mostly Canada based, but there are definitely organizations across the world. I have met really interesting people just mentoring at those events who, um, you know, I'll add on LinkedIn and even sometimes like talked about collaborating with each other on things. So that's one way to meet people too. And, and that's definitely something that can be done in the virtual space right now. And there's also, um, I think there's a big online presence too. Like Twitter actually has a really good space for developers and mentors in tech. Um, some people, some good people to follow. There's like Ali Spittle is a really good um, like person on tech on Twitter to follow. She often posts about, um, you know, advice, but also I think at one point in time, she had some office hours where she was just giving advice to some people in tech. Uh, so there's that as well, like taking advantage of that online space. And there's definitely websites where you can find mentors specifically for tech as well. Awesome. Sadie, if, if any of those resources you mentioned, if you have them on hand, we can send them out to everyone here um, along with the recording of, of today's session. Um, Definitely, yeah. But yeah, I think uh, you mentioned sort of asking questions and asking for advice, sort of the simplest form of, of mentorship. Um, it, it reminded me of the, the quote that uh, asking a question is the highest form of flattery. Uh, I think oftentimes we feel sort of stupid when we're asking a question, but when, you're, when someone asks you a question, it's usually quite flattering. So that's something to keep in mind too. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially when it's about something technical too. Like I have often found that my 30 second question ends up in an hour long conversation because, you know, you're asking someone that's passionate about it and they want to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, the I, I think that's all the questions that I have and, and the chat's quieted down here. So um, I think we'll leave it at that, just looking that we have four minutes left. But thank you so much. I think that was, I mean, I really enjoyed it. I think it was really helpful. If you go through the, the chat here, everyone's sort of relating to your experiences and uh, hopefully everyone's feeling like they're not alone in imposter syndrome. But so any closing, closing words you'd like to say, go ahead and, and that's it for today. Oh, thanks everyone. I'm looking at the chat now and it's really awesome. Um, Jennifer, I definitely agree. Once you get past the junior, the job op opportunities are a lot more available. I definitely remember thinking and being told that in that period of time, this is the worst it's going to be. And once you get past that, it gets a lot better. So bear that in mind too. Um, and Flexbox Zombies is awesome as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, thanks everyone so much. Like I'm really flattered uh, that, that you all came out and listened to me for a little while, but I hope, I hope some of that's helpful. Um, I really look forward to seeing, you know, seeing all of you in the tech world, wherever that may be. Yeah, thanks so much, Sadie. You closed out our final imposter syndrome episode of 2020. Um, and I, I can't think of a better person to have done it. So thanks so much. And, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Mm -hmm.